Hello YouTube! In this video I want to talk about the cluelessness objection to utilitarianism. Well, this is actually an objection to many different consequentialist theories, but I'm going to focus on utilitarianism just because it's the most straightforward. So, utilitarianism says that the right action is whichever action maximises happiness. And, of course, it, uh, it assesses this completely impartially. So, it doesn't matter, you know, where or when the happiness occurs. It doesn't matter who is the bearer of the happiness. Um, ha like, the states of happiness uh, are, are sort of equally valuable and states of suffering are equally disvaluable regardless of uh, who is the bearer of those states. So, you know, um, if, you have the, if you have the choice between two actions where uh, one action will produce a thousand happy people a million years in the future, and the other action will produce like 900 happy people today, well, the utilitarian would say the first action is preferable, right? You, because you just want to produce the most happiness regardless of where or when it occurs. So that's utilitarianism. I'm sure we're all familiar with how that works. Um, so there's the, but the problem with this, uh, so there's this, this objection, the cluelessness objection, which is, well... Whether or not an action is right is going to depend on the long-term consequences of the action. Indeed, it's going to depend on just, I mean, not just like long-term, but like indefinite term, right? So, I mean, any action I perform is going to have a sort of causal effect. It's going to be part of some causal chain that just continues indefinitely. And we have no idea what the long-term consequences of our actions are. So, for instance, you know, let's say we're, we're in the sort of trolley case where there's a trolley going down the tracks and it's heading towards, um, it's heading towards five people. You can switch the trolley so that it kills just one person rather than the five. Well, obviously, obviously the utilitarian is going to say, well, you know, you should switch, right? Better to kill one person to save five. Um, because, you know, that's going to that's gonna maximise happiness. But wait, it's only going to maximise happiness if we consider the sort of short to medium term future, right? You know, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, we could just say, well, you know, for all we know, right, maybe the one person who gets killed um, would, you know, go on to be like a cancer researcher and cure cancer. Or maybe, you know, they would end up being the parent of somebody who is the parent of somebody who goes on to cure cancer. Um, you know, we, we don't know. And indeed, for any action I perform, um, like, it's going to be part of a causal chain which can have all sorts of unforeseen consequences. Like, my decision to, you know, get out of bed at a particular time um, might be somehow part of a causal chain that you know, a hundred years into the future leads to the election of a terrible tyrant. Like, if I had gotten out of bed one minute earlier, then that terrible tyrant would not have been elected. Um, so the thought is, is that, you know, the utilitarian is, is sort of saying, well, um, you perform the action that produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But the trouble is, is that when we consider that completely impartially, and in particular, when we consider the long term consequences of our actions, we are clueless about what that would be like I can I can say you know in the short term like yeah I mean killing one person to save five is going to maximize happiness uh in the short term but I have no idea how that's going to ramify in the long term this is the, the cluelessness problem this is the objection but here's the thing it's not entirely obvious what the objection actually is like why is this a problem? So, first of all, I'm just going to assume, for the sake of argument, that uh, that we are in fact clueless. Um, so, there have been people who have responded to this, and who, who you know, there, there are arguments that uh, this doesn't, you know, that this assumption doesn't really work. But let's just grant it, okay? So, we're going to grant that I am in fact clueless about the long-term consequences. So, is this a problem for utilitarianism? So, I mean, here's. Here's a, here's a suggestion, right? Um, maybe utilitarianism is right, but it just turns out that we have no idea what we ought to do. It just turns out that we end up having to endorse a kind of moral scepticism. 
Um, I mean, this wouldn't be moral skepticism in the meta-ethical sense, right? So we, we could, well, you know, maybe we're moral realists, right? And we say that, you know, utilitarianism is the correct moral theory, the objectively correct moral theory. But then it turns out when it comes to assessing our own uh, our actions and we, we try to figure out, like, well, what ought I do? What action ought I take? I just have no idea. Um, now, that's an uncomfortable conclusion, of course. But the thing is that utilitarians are already quite happy to accept uncomfortable conclusions. Um, you know, utilitarians generally, I, I think more so than, um, than, than is the case for other uh, moral theories, utilitarians tend to be happy to accept quite radical violations of our moral intuitions, right? Um, so, you know, if you think about something like uh, the demandingness objection, the demandingness objection would be, Utilitarianism seems seems to entail that, um, you know, we we ought to make enormous sacrifices. So, um, you know, uh, Peter Singer, for instance, famously argued, um, you know, in just the same way that uh, if you see a child drowning in a pond, uh, you ought to go in to save that child, even if it means ruining your nice new shoes. Well, you know, if you have if you have the money to buy some nice new shoes, really, you should send that money uh, to buy malaria nets or something, right? And, and in fact, like, any money that you might spend on a luxury for yourself, well, you would maximise happiness by sending it to buy malaria nets. Um, of course, again, we're, you know, that, that assumes uh, that this cluelessness problem doesn't hold, right? But um, but the point is, you know, a lot of utilitarians have found this very persuasive. That actually, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, the the what you ought, that you are, um, you know, you are making a a pretty serious kind of you know moral uh, moral violation uh, by you know spending money on new clothes rather than using the money to save a life. Um, you know, what you've done is effectively equivalent to killing somebody in order to uh, get some new clothes for yourself. And that is morally egregious, right? Um, so utilitarianism already seems to have uh, highly counterintuitive consequences. And it seems to me that, okay, well, maybe when, you know, maybe we are in fact clueless about uh, the consequences of our actions. And then it just entails that um, utilitarianism leads to a kind of moral skepticism where we just don't know what to do. I mean, I suppose one of the assumptions that underlies this argument is that it's a condition of adequacy on moral theories that they be action guiding. So, like, the assumption is, is that in, in order for a moral theory to be acceptable, the moral theory has to tell us what to do. And it has to be such that, like, when I'm in, like, a, like when I'm in a situation and I'm trying to figure out what action I ought to take, then the moral theory should tell me, right? It should tell me that. Okay, so there's two points about this. First of all, I think that a lot of utilitarians already draw a distinction between the principles which tell us what the right action is and the principles that we're supposed to apply in our like everyday behavior. So this is found in things like two-level utilitarianism, um, where the idea, the, the idea would be, well, the right action is whichever action maximizes happiness. But of course, human beings are very limited and flawed and we often make mistakes. And, you know, when it comes to sort of our everyday behavior, often we'll find ourselves in situations where we just don't have time to like work out all of the consequences. So, you know, what we should be, really we should be acting in accordance with more general rules of thumb. Um, like that's the, 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 the best way for us to maximize happiness is not to try to maximize happiness, but is to act in accordance with more general rules of thumb. So it's like you have you have the utilitarianism proper, the sort of moral theory which says the right action is to, is whichever maximizes happiness. But then you kind of recognize that, well, human beings are cognitively limited in various ways, so we wouldn't be very good at applying that principle in our behavior. So then we have these other sort of more common sense moral principles that Maybe maybe they don't maximize happiness, but at least uh, they do the best that we can. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess if we take seriously this problem of cluelessness, then the answer would be, well, okay, we have this 
principle which tells us that the right action is whichever maximizes happiness and then that pick and the, that of course is going to specify a particular action as being the one that we ought to have done but then it will just turn out that there there is no set of principles that we can use uh to uh to figure out what we ought to, to figure out what we ought to do um but the point is is that it's it it already is part of a lot of utilitarian theories that um you know what what guides my behavior like it's not the utilitarian principle itself that is guiding my be that should guide my behavior um so that's that's one point i mean just a, a a more general point about this idea that moral theory should be action guiding is well you know i mean apply this in like a different domain so apply this to um you know the case of like prudential reasoning uh, i am concerned about my own welfare and obviously i would like it if i was able to figure out what would be the best way of uh, improving my own welfare but then you know in principle i might be in situations where i'm just clueless about that so um let's say that i'm in a a prison and there's two buttons and uh one of these buttons will kill me the other button will open the door and set me free um now in that maybe in that situation i just don't know what to do i don't know which button to press uh i'm clueless uh, I'm not given any information that would allow me to, you know, make a decision. But that doesn't stop me from, you know, valuing my own welfare. I still value my own welfare. It's just uh, uh, I happen to be in a situation where I, I don't know what to do to improve it. And so similarly, uh, why shouldn't we just be in that situation with respect to, um, you know, our, our moral thinking, right? Maybe I value the maximization of happiness, or maybe indeed maximizing happiness is what you objectively, uh, is what's objectively good. Uh, and there's just, unfortunately, no way for me to know what the best way to achieve that is. But there's another way to push this cluelessness problem, which maybe raises further issues, which is, maybe it's not that we don't know what the consequences of some action would be. Maybe it's that there is no fact of the matter what the consequences of some action would be. Um, so how could there be no fact of the matter what the consequences of some action would be? Well, I mean, one option here is just maybe the world is metaphysically indeterminate. Um, so maybe there's phenomena going on uh, on the quantum level or whatever, uh, where, you know, like, the exact time at which an atom decays is indeterminate, it's just not fixed. Um, that might be the case for all we know. Uh, there are more uh, technical problems as well with, uh, so when we, when, we, when we ask ourselves like, okay, what, what would the consequences of some action be? We're engaging in, you know, like if I had done some action P, then Q would have resulted. Uh, that's a counterfactual. And there are issues with counterfactuals, which I've talked about in a lot more detail in, an, in another video that I will link in the comments called Are All Counterfactuals False? So, you know, but anyway, if, if we, you know, if the universe is indeterminate or if we get on board with some of these uh, criticisms of counterfactuals, then maybe it just turns out that there's no fact of the matter what consequences, what the consequences of my action would be. Um, I mean, I guess just one way to think about this intuitively is to, is to say, well, you know, like take some event in the past. Um, let's say, for instance, um, let's say Hitler had won World War II, right? What would the consequences of that ha have been? Um, I mean, we can tell a story, right? <laughs> Obviously, we can, we, we can tell lots of stories. And it's not entirely clear that, like, that there's any particular story that is the right one. Um, so if Hitler had won World War II, well, all sorts of things might have happened after that. Um, and so, you know, the consequences of that are, are, are just metaphysically indeterminate. It's not just that we don't know what the consequences would have been. It's that there's no fact of the matter. Um, now, if, it, if there's no fact of the matter, this maybe raises further issues because... Um, so I said, you know, okay, utilitarianism, the principle is that uh, the right action is whichever action maximizes happiness. Um, but if there's no fact of the matter, what the long-term consequences of an action are, 
then don't we have to say that there just is no right action? Um, and maybe that is the problem. Again, though, I'm not sure that this is really a problem for utilitarianism. Uh, it seems to me that instead of... It, it, it might just be that, well, morality is thoroughly indeterminate. Um, that utilitarianism is correct about what, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's correct as, as an account of what the moral facts would be. It just turns out that, um, you know, the, the world is not, uh, is not cooperative, <laughs> let's say. Um, so it turns out that, yeah, there, there just is no action that counts as the right action. And there is no action that counts as a good action. And there is no action that counts as a bad action. Um, so perhaps what's morally good is to maximise happiness impartially, but the world might be structured in such a way that maximising happiness is impossible. Um, so, you know, no actions count as morally good. I mean, OK, compare this, right? Let's say that there was a world in which there were beings where those beings just had no feelings, no emotions. Um, would we say that utilitarianism is false in that world? Mm, that's not obvious, right? It seems like a utilitarian could say, well, you know, util look, utilitarianism is, is correct. It's just that the world that we've described here is one where uh, it, it's just never going to be anything other than neutral, right? Like, uh, you know, there, there, there's nothing that's like good or bad. This is just neutral and no action can make anything better or worse. Or think about a world where there are no reliable principles of induction. Um, a world much more chaotic than ours, where, you know, no actions correlate with any particular outcome. I mean, I suppose it's kind of hard to imagine, um, like, agents like us existing in such a world, but, you know. Uh, um, I mean, I guess, you know, just imagine yourself transported to a world where just suddenly uh, you, you, you were not able to sort of perform an action that had any consistent consequences at all. Well, would that... Um, would, would, you, would you then say that utilitarianism is false in that world? I don't think so. I think the utilitarian, what the utilitarian should say is, okay, well, this is just a world in which, um, yeah, I mean, there's just nothing we can say. You know, there, there's no action that counts as right or wrong, as good or bad. Uh, now, it may be that our world is like these worlds. Our world is a world which is sort of, uncooperative with morality. Um, and this is, of course, a, a somewhat pessimistic conclusion, um, but then maybe pessimism is the right conclusion. In fact, it's worth noting, I think, that uh, presumably our world has been uncooperative for the vast majority of its history, because for the vast majority of its history, it contained agents who were unable to consider the consequences of their actions uh, at least they were unable to consider the consequences of their actions from a moral point of view, right? I mean, because uh, only only human beings can do that, you know? I mean, uh, we, we don't, like, sure, I mean, uh, we can sort of say that, like, a lion, right, when the lion uh, eats the antelope and the antelope is e under extreme suffering, then, you know, a utilitarian can look at that and say, well, that's bad. But in a sense, this is when I say this is like uncooperative with morality, it's that it just wouldn't make any, it wouldn't really make sense to say that like, well, the lion should have done something different. Um, you know, like the, I mean, the lion just, the lion just acts, right? It doesn't even think about this stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, in a sense, it looks like we've, we've lived in a world that is uncooperative with morality. Uh, so we, we, we have a world that is uncooperative with morality in various ways. And so, um, if it turns out that there is no fact of the matter what the consequences of our actions are, then, well, this is just a way in which our world is uncooperative with morality. Maybe in maybe a much deeper way, right? Our world could not be cooperative with morality. Uh, so in a sense, our world would, as far as morality is concerned, our world would be like the world in which there are just no reliable principles of induction at all. Um, so our world would be equivalent to the completely chaotic world where, you know, we're just not able to correlate an action with any given consequence. So the thing is, is that like our world seems to be cooperative with morality because we are able to sort of say that we're, we're able to reliably predict 
certain consequences of our actions. Um, but the problem is, is that morality requires us, requires it to be the case that there are, there's some fact of the matter, what the consequences in general of our actions are. What we, you know, what I can do is I can say, well, you know, if I perform this action, it's going to have these consequences within the next hour, within the next day, within the next hundred years, maybe. Um, but there's n there's no facts of the matter what the consequences will be just indefinitely. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I kind of have this illusion because I can control some of the consequences. I have this illusion that the world is cooperative with morality, but actually it isn't. Um, and that's a, as I said, pessimistic in c conclusion. But then I, I think that if I, if I were a utilitarian, I would I would not see this as a refutation of utilitarianism. I would just see this as, OK, utilitarianism leads to this pessimistic conclusion. Um, I mean, again, like suppose, for instance, that I'm in a prison. Uh, so, you know, think of this from just the point of view of like my own welfare. OK, I care about my own welfare. So I'm in a prison. There are two buttons. One will open the door. One will kill me. Now, let's say that like which button opens the door is determined completely randomly as I press the button. So maybe it's determined by like the decay of an atom or something like that. Um, so in fact, before I press the button, there is no fact of the matter which button will open the door and which will kill me. Uh, there's no fact of the matter which button I ought to press if my concern is to maximize my own well-being. Um, well, I would still say that my welfare matters. Uh, <laughs> I, I still care about my own welfare. It's just there's no fact of the matter what I ought to do. Um, there's no fact of the matter how to uh, promote my own welfare. Um, so yeah, I mean, what we end up with, I guess, is a, a, a kind of moral skepticism and a, a, a pessimistic conclusion. But I don't think that this is something that should be taken to refute utilitarianism. Um, Anyway, that's, those are my thoughts on that. <laughs>